Uh, welcome. You're listening to the Mike Hewitt Show, and my name is Mike Hewitt. My guest today in the studio with me is Cindy Duran, who is a candidate for state representative in the 79th District. Uh, welcome. Thank you. I am very happy to be here. Do me a favor. Tell us a little bit before we get going about you and the race, uh, for v listeners and viewers both, uh, tell me, what the, where is the 79th? What area does that take in? Well, the 79th district is really the far southwest corner of Michigan. So it's right along the lakefront. It's a lot of agricultural area. Uh, it starts in about the city of Bridgman going north and goes to, or south, and goes to Water Valley, um going north. So it's a pretty big area to cover. Um, as I said, a lot of farms, um, businesses, Cities that people have heard of are Benton Harbor, St. Joseph, um, Bridgman. Uh, those are the main cities that are in the 79th district. Okay, that's a big geography. It is a big geography. It's a lot of territory to cover. It's a lot of doors to knock on. I was going to ask, <laughs> how many? How many? We have probably covered about 3,500 doors. In fact, I've got a group out this evening while I'm here. Um, and so they will probably, I would think, do a couple hundred tonight. Uh, so we are out every day and every evening, except for Sundays right now. Saturday's always our big push. We're always hoping to get a big group out on Saturdays. And um, we will be doing that this Saturday. Very, very nice. I, I gotta tell you, I've been a candidate before, and I really liked knocking on the doors, except for it gets very tiring. Um, it can be a little bit overwhelming. It can be, but I have found it to be quite exhilarating at the same time. I will say I have not had one bad experience. I know that's hard to believe, and people get a little frightened by knocking on doors, but it has been a pleasure. Very it good. truly has. I have had gracious, friendly people. You probably know the old adage that says the person that knocks on the most doors and sends the direct, most direct mail will win. I have heard that. Uh, there, that that <laughs> that's, that's the saying. So tell me this, as I understand it, you're a primary challenger. Yes, I am. So you're in, you're a Republican, and you're challenging an incumbent Republican. Republican. Okay, tell me, does, by the way, I've done that before, just as a little <laughs> bit of a disclosure. But what causes you to do that? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Um, one reason is I'm a grandmother with eight grandchildren, um, six in Michigan, so I worry about that. Um, the votes that my opponent has cast, particularly in the last two years, uh, go counter to what my values and principles are. And really when I talked to him about it, he said, if you don't like it, primary me. So I took him up on his challenge. Did he literally say that? He literally said that. Okay. He literally said that. Votes, votes matter. Yes. Um, I called him on his health care exchange vote because he voted for it. And he told me it was the most conservative way he could vote. And I said, what is, cons what is limited government about health care exchanges? And he said, if you don't like it, primary me. So I he took him He must have said that it. a little bit snarky. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, he did. I don't think he expected me to take him up on it. Yeah, I bet he loved that. Yeah, <laughs> no, he didn't. <laughs> Especially being that it was his idea. Right. That's I, funny. He probably would not claim that now. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. You know, I met him once. Uh, he was a pretty gregarious fellow. That's probably the word to put to it. I don't know him. I met him. We shook hands in a large group of people, and I didn't didn't really draw a, a conclusion from him other than he's on my Facebook page, um, and, and he's got a number of votes that that probably would have caused me to consider doing what you're doing. Um, but and we'll, and we'll get into those, but before we get into issues and the whys and the whats and all that, tell me a little bit about you. Who is Cindy Duran? Well, um, as I tell people when I introduce myself, I'm a uh, wife and a mother of three daughters and mother-in-law to three son-in-laws. I have eight grandchildren. My husband and I will be married 42 years next week. And, uh, so it was new, you're just kind of trying it out. Right. Okay. <laughs> right. Uh, grew up in Bering County, uh, was born in Bering County, uh, been there our whole lives. I grew up in Spinks Corners, and your listeners probably won't know that, but we call it God's Country. It's a beautiful agriculture area. Grew up on a farm there. Uh, I um, 
went back to school and got my uh, degree as a registered nurse and so worked in the Medicaid program. Uh, I, for, read, I read that, but for, tell me, what does it mean? I know the RN part, but what does it mean to, to work in the Medicaid program? Well, that's a very interesting program. I worked in a program called the Michigan Medicaid Waiver Program, which is a community-based services program, and it was a nursing home alternative. So it was for people who were nursing home eligible and then received Medicaid benefits in order to stay in their homes. One of the issues I beat up on a lot on the show is the Medicaid explosion, as I affectionately call it. And with your background in Medicaid, I'm interested, how would you have voted on the Medicaid explosion that Governor O. Snyder put through? Oh, there is no question I would not have voted for that. Um, Medicaid has, I call it, a lot of unintended consequences. And I always said if the taxpayers of Michigan knew how their tax dollars are being spent through Medicaid, they would revolt. Um, Give me an example or two. Well, when, when I first started in the program, I was proud of the program because I believed that it was being administered at the state level f fairly well. But as the program progressed, and I was in it for 15 years, I saw a lot of changes in the program. So from people being restricted to being nursing home eligible medically and physically and financially, now they could drive a car and work and still be in the program. And I don't know about you, but I don't know too many people that are nursing home eligible that drive a car. So the requirements and the agenda changed, and that changed at the state level. It became not about physical needs of clients. It became about their emotional needs, and it became about providing their heart's desires some of the language I find in that industry a little bit fearsome, and tell me if I'm on the wrong path here, but I hear some of the folks that are in circumstances like you're describing, they'll refer to what I think of as entitlements and welfare as benefits. And I think of benefits as what you get when you get a good job after you've earned your way to get the good job. So I'm, I'm having a tough time sometimes with the new language. Um, benefits come with a good job, welfare comes with, with welfare, and don't misunderstand me, I'm not for not doing good to the poor, to, to, to paraphrase Ben Franklin a little bit, but I'm not for making them easy in poverty. And some of the examples that I would allude to on that path, um, for instance, the recent minimum wage bump. A lot of these folks that are receiving benefits were upset by the minimum wage jump because it, it cuts into their benefits. Right. And you think, what? <laughs> what kind of upside down backwards thinking? Yeah. Have we legislated mm -hmm. to have that be the response to the minimum wage bump? I can't work more hours now because I'll lose my benefits. Right. <laughs> <laughs> to me, that's as foreign thinking as you could possibly right. get. But from your vantage, how do you see that? Well, I see that, that same thing. And as I said, I, I have no complaints with some of the agencies that are administering, particularly the program I was in. But it... It comes from the top. All of a sudden, guidelines change. Um, it becomes based on somebody else's agenda. And this became based on Department of C Community of Mental Health. And so they were the ones that were managing the program. So their agenda is what they pushed and, and pushed on the, on the outcomes of the program. So that is what took priority over everything. So an example of that would be for listeners and viewers is in, in my interpretation, and you live there, so tell me where I'm wrong. From the outside looking in, it felt more like the goal wasn't to get someone mentally or physically healthy, the goal was billing hours. And so their entire hiring practice and the hierarchy was set up based on who could generate the most return for billing hours and not for patients with resolved resolve problems. Yes, part of that is true. And I will just give you one example of one of the issues that we dealt with when it changed to meeting their heart's desire. I was at a state meeting, huge group of people, and the director of the program stated what the new goals of the program were. And she said, for example, if you have a client, and our clients were elderly with a lot of dementia, 
if you have a client that wants to learn how to fly an airplane, your job is to make that happen because that is what their heart's desire is. And we all laughed. But they were serious. They were serious. So if I become a client and my <laughs> desire is to be a billionaire, will yes. you will you, will and, you find the way the path forward for me? And by the way, I only want to work at about 10 hours a week. Is that going to happen? So that <laughs> got all involved in the care plan, those kind of issues, and it became just a minutia thing which would involve paperwork and that's what you spent your time doing paperwork paperwork and then you have to write paperwork about the paperwork right. you wrote right so that when i'm one of those fellows that says i put a dollar in to the government with the help with the hope of helping people but of that dollar 87 cents was blown on administrative right. so 13 cents of my buck may or may not have actually benefited but to me, it's one of those things where the, it, it's like, it's, it, remember the old the stories back in the 70s when they said they built cars to break so that you could have to get mm -hmm. them fixed and all that? Mm -hmm. It feels a little bit like they're doing that with patient care. Okay, The idea isn't to cure you, it's to keep you on the program forever. Right. I, and, and if you saw the recent news that came out last week about the felons that are employed, and that happened to be the program I worked in, um, because there again... It's about client choice and making the client happy. So if they choose to have a caregiver who's a relative who is a felon, then you have no choice but to do that for them. And so in essence, they, are, they set the rules. And um, you have a lot of people who want their granddaughter, grandson hired as their caregiver, paid for under the Medicaid program, that have um, felony records and that becomes their choice and then you have this huge battle about what to do. <laughs> it's like someone somehow is able to steal common sense out of right. the equation. Right. Yep. And, but they all sit around in conferences and stare at each other like it's perfectly logical. Right. And they forget frequently. It's like going to a step <laughs> yeah. conference. That it's taxpayer money that they're spending. I don't think they care. I, I really don't. I, I think truly, truly, it's become very, very political, and there's only one voice, yes. one political voice in that universe. Um, and it's it's a real feel-good rationale. Yes. That's how it looks, at least it, from the yeah. outside looking in. Yes. So tell me, what are your other interests? Well, Common Core, of course. Was, you like uh, Common Core? The, oh. <laughs> I've gave, given a lot of talks on Common Core. I have, um, like I said, eight grandchildren, six in the state of Michigan. Now three were, are being homeschooled. My other daughter just moved to Michigan from Indiana, and um, she has decided now to pull her kids from the public school and homeschool. I do have the other side of it. I have a daughter who's a middle school principal in the public school system in Indiana. Um, now, aren't they in the middle of kicking Common Core out the door? They are. Um, there's some suspicions if that is actually happening or it's just some uh, way Smoke of rewording or, things. Yeah. Uh, she is suspicious that they are actually going to um, get rid of it all. Now, tell me again now, she, what is her, what's her function at the school? She's a principal, middle she's school a principal. principal. Now, is she pro Common Core? Or? No, she's not pro Common Core. I will say that in the state of Indiana, they have resisted some of the common core education so the school she was at was not implementing very much of it different schools and different communities sort of like michigan were implementing it at different times um, and now the school she's at now uh, she doesn't anticipate they're going to be um, doing the common core in fact they were just told that some of the extra testing that was directed by the indiana um, Secretary of Education, they're not going, they're choosing not to do. Right. So I don't think they have the same. Um, not a mandate, it's a choice. Right, and it's right. not, it is tied to state funding, but not as much as Michigan is. Tell me what, what are your, what's your primary, um, what's your gripe with Common Core? Why don't you like it? Well, I have several concerns about it. One being the whole, um, changing of our history, changing of the story of America, uh, the story of exceptionalism 
is completely removed from the Common Core. So you're opposed to your grandkids becoming global citizens. Yes, I am. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, of course, everybody knows, I think everybody knows about the math. Um, it makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, and the, the data tracking is a huge concern when you think they're going to be tracking this information on our children forever and ever. And the indoctrination of the whole program is just a very scary thing. You know it's what I find fascinating about it, and I've asked or probably roll his eyes because I've told the story about a dozen times, but um, th there's an SAT score floating around. It's a little bit of a historical thing. It's a graph. It shows the results on an SAT of the folks that were born in 1952. And they took it, and then the folks that were born in 1953 all the way through to the year 1992. So it covered a 40-year track of people born each year. And if you look at it on a, on a it's, it was actually a bar graph, and it goes straight down. Mm -hmm. There was never a year under the educational, mm -hmm. the public education system, there has not been a year where it plateaued or where it went up. Every year for 40 years, and I think, listen, I'm not an educated fella. I'm, I'm not, I'm just an old country horse sense person. But when I look at 40 consecutive yeah. nonstop years, I have to stand back and say, I don't think that's an accident. Right. Okay. Right. So then when they say, we've got the next chapter, we're going to turn the page on you. Yeah. And the very first thing I see is global citizen. And and that it, the, the whole path seems to be forward about a handful of things. I think it's federal control regardless of what they say. I agree. Because money's tied to the Fed and what we do and what we don't do. I think it is is a global citizen push. The only way to get a global society is to level off education. Mm -hmm. We're not going to raise the world up to where we were, so that means we're going to have to lower America down to where the world is at. And I think they've done a pretty good job mm -hmm. on that path. Um, but it's frightening, and there's a lot of folks that are not, not uh, fighting back. Tell me, your opponent, how did he vote on Common Core? He voted for Common Core. He's in favor of it. Mm -hmm. Would you define mm -hmm. him as being a moderate? Is that the word? or A moderate. A rhino, <laughs> yes. Okay, yeah. yeah. yeah if you look him, at but... his votes the last two years, he on several scorecards that tracks the legislator votes. You probably know about those. He has had everything from um, the lowest was a thirty-three percent rating. The Democrats score higher than he does. Uh, when he first ran several years ago, he was at a seventy-nine. Um, so he has steadily gone down. Right. And then when you look at his financial contributions, you can see why he's steadily gone down. I'm going to stop you there. We're going to go to a break. Folks, we'll be right back. I've made a discovery. The down-home community our grandparents loved is still here. Seriously, that's what you'll find at Renegade River in downtown Spring Lake. You might be looking for a new or used hunting rifle or something for personal defense. Maybe a DNR sport license or fishing supplies. Personal and home defense. Hunting, Army, Navy supplies, fishing, survival gear, and even a tools and guy stuff consignment department. You'll be greeted by low prices and quick professional service provided by shopkeeper Mike Hewitt. If you're not in a hurry, grab a cup of coffee and join in the conversation. Renegade River, firearms, hunting, personal protection and survival gear, going camping or looking for emergency products. Come take advantage of the prices while meeting up with old friends and making new ones. Renegade River, next to the police station in downtown Spring Lake. Or go to the website RenegadeRiver.com My name is Oscar Osbo, Oscar Osbo Audio and Video. I've been doing it for over 14 years here in the White Lake area. I've been doing the video for over 20 and radio for over 30. I'd like to tell you a little bit about what I do and I can do for you. I can make commercials for much cheaper than the other guys. Video editing, life stories, music videos, and sporting events. I also have been a DJ for over 30 years, so I have a DJ service that I like to bring to your next special event. So give me a call at 231-288-3580 or 231-894-0091. That's 894-0091. Also, one of my specialties is to transfer your VHS tapes, your cassette tapes, your 8-track tape, your DV tape, your VHC tape, your 
8mm, your Super 8mm, how about your Hi8, or maybe even your records. I can digitally transfer those, usually to be better than the originals. And to do that, I only charge $10 a DVD and $5 a CD to do the transfer. And then copies are even cheaper. So give me a call now if you have any of those things that you want done just for you. Oscar Osbo Audio and Video at 894-0091 or 288-3580. Call me today. Hi, if you ever find yourself arrested in jail and got bail, make sure you call me, Tommy D, at Bad Boys Bail Bonds, 866-728-728. 6400 because if I can't get you out, you ain't getting out. Uh, welcome back to the Mike Hewitt Show. Cindy, when we left off, we were kind of just getting into a little bit more Common Core. And and, and uh, tell me a little bit what, what some of the things I hear when I've complained about Common Core is, Mike, don't you want standards for our young? And so I ask you, if we were to get rid of Common Core, should we replace it with something? What would be your suggestion? Well, I just think that um, we can reevaluate the standards that, that Michigan has. I know, I believe it's the state of Massachusetts had excellent standards. And let's have states develop their own standards. And, and then to test a program with the same material that you've been teaching kids on makes no sense whatsoever. Um, so you've got these tests that are adjusted to the material that's been taught. Uh, how can you learn anything that way? You can't evaluate if a program is succeeding if you weight the tests and the material with the same writing people. It just doesn't make any sense. No, and I'll go you a step further, a couple steps, because I want to give you some thoughts and then have you Tell me a little bit of feedback, okay? The, the, the first is, is when I look at the curriculum. Well, let me, let me do twofold here. The, the, let me start with different. I'm a little bit different than you on one issue. I don't want to reduce it to the state. I want to reduce it back to the, local, to the local school board. Now when you go to a school board meeting, they're mostly talking about where to invest the booster money. What are we going to do with the cafeteria money? Do we still have money in that mutual fund, or do we have it over in this one? And in my mind's eye, I think the needs of young people being educated in Muskegon County are, are, are not necessarily the same needs as the children in, in Berrien, not necessarily the same needs as those in, in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, or Los Angeles, California. I think there are cultural needs, and to ignore them and pretend they don't exist is foolish. Um, and so what it, to, it, to me, it's like they're using this big, gigantic peanut butter knife to try to level everybody out, but that's just not a reality. Right, and I guess when I say local control, I'm yep. comparing the state to the federal government. Sure. Or, uh, and I do believe it should be returned to local control. I agree that school boards are dealing with this, um, we can say, petty things now right. and not even knowing what's going on in the schools. I have talked to parents, school board members, and teachers when I ask them, what is going on with the Common Core? What do you know about it? Nothing. I own a gun shop. Did you know that? No. I do. And I had a conversation with a fella that's probably 80-ish, okay? Very nice man. And we were talking about Common Core, and he rolled his eyes, and, and I started talking about local school boards, and some other young fella piped up. He said, well, would you go? He, he echoed me, by the way. The young guy he kind of parroted me, n not by just what happened to say the same train of thought, which is parents don't go to the school board meetings. I've said that a lot on this mm -hmm. show. You go to the school board meeting, and there's three or four parents that are there mad because their kid got punished when right. he or she ought not to have, when in truth, by the way, they should have. That issue aside, that's what the young man said. And the old man said, well, you know, I think what happened is that the school boards used to be full of people and when school boards made decisions. And the, le the less of the value of the decisions, the less of the value there were for parents to actually go. And so his, his overall right. thought was was the more responsibility we've taken away from parents, the worse the results of education have become. Sure, I would agree. Those are all those unintended consequences of an expanded government. Uh, 
going back to the Medicaid program, which is comparable, because when I first started working where, uh, where I worked, they were telling me that all the services were provided in the community by volunteer organizations who provided um, help for people, food, clothing, help with utility bills, that sort of thing. But as soon as the government got involved, all that help dried up. And so it wasn't available any anymore. And I think that is the same thing that has happened with school boards. Um, as the government has gotten more involved and taken more control over things, then you've had less of a local input into um, school board meetings, into what's going on with education, what's going on with schools. Because after all, the rules are all set by the government. Right. Same, same with... Um um, even builders permits and uh, all of these local level decisions you got the local folks that are running around feeling very important but the, what they're, what right. they're doing is they're saying okay paragraph 4 right. section 3 item 1 yeah. says XYZ so they've just become the, the warden of somebody else's directive right and and, and they sp spend their time figuring out how they're going to meet that particular new guideline or right regulation. We did that in the program I work for. Spend hours figuring how you're going to meet that right. to satisfy somebody. Some, <laughs> some bureaucratic right. little, little uh, you know, digit right. that. Tell me this, well, um, let's switch gears a little bit again. You, you've, have you followed the Detroit pension bailout? Yes. What's yes. Your, what, would you, well, did you support it? No, I did not. No. Did, did your opponent support yes, it? Yes, he did. Okay, you guys are really different. Yes, we are very You're different. You're both Republicans, right? Yeah. <laughs> I support the Republican platform. He, none of his votes support the Republican platform. Right. Um, no, I... Is he, a, is he in a leadership position? Yes. Okay. He's under appropriations. Okay. So, okay. And um, is in the mix for the new speaker. Okay. So that... If, if you look at the votes, that might explain a few things. Okay. I've never understood that concept. I had uh, the RNC committee man, Dave Agema, on last week, along with Representative Hooker, and we talked for probably too long on that topic. But the concept that, in fact, I teased him a little bit. I said, I don't understand what's wrong with you folks. I look at the current speaker, and I don't mean, I, I, I probably was over the top, but when I... When I look at the House Caucus, the Republican House Caucus, I'm thinking, honest to goodness, all of you pooled your votes and this is the guy mm -hmm. you supported because he doesn't support, to your point, the Republican right. Party platform. Um, I, don't, I don't get that. How It seems like they would try to pick someone that was not a moderate in the sense of being a Democrat, but that was a moderate, say, in the middle of the pack for the Republican idea. I could understand that. We've got some moderate Republicans, some very conservative. Let's get a man or a woman that's somewhere off in the middle of that mix that can repla re relate to the Republican caucus, not the, not the other side of the aisle, right? I am not sure that that plays into it, unfortunately. What do you think plays into it? Because honestly, I don't understand. I think, again, what plays into it is power and money. Okay. And so the person that can raise the most dough right. and, and help the most candidates right, in, throughout in other the districts, state. sure. And they um, then are granted the favor of their vote to be speaker. They have an unimaginable amount of power. Yes, they do. As speaker, I don't know if citizens understand the governor, the the Senate majority leader, and the speaker of the house. The three of those folks, they decide everything that's going to get heard. And it, I used to be very very naive on this point. I would think that the party that was in the minority had to sit around and wait for the party that was in the majority. And the reality of it is is that everybody sits around and waits for these three people mm -hmm. to figure out what direction they're they're going to point the wind to blow in. And I don't know that that's what our founders <laughs> had in, in mind, mind at all. I would agree. And I have been trying to educate people as much as you can standing at somebody's door. Sure. What that means. Are people, by the way, are people, how, how what's the typical reaction to you being a primary challenger when you're knocking on somebody's door. I'm here to tra challenge the incumbent. Well, as soon as I say his name, yep. and I say his name, he is very well known in the district. Right. Very well known. He's um, does a, he's always been on the radio. He's been a part of um, the 
Upton group. Since he started, he was Fred Upton's aide for a lot of years, and so he's always had a, an active role in the area. So as soon as I say his name, everybody steps back and says, oh, you're brave. Because <laughs> he's pretty powerful. Yes, he's pretty powerful. And, and, you know, you've got a woman challenging a man, which adds another component to it. And a lot of people know, know him. They know how he comes across. So they are very surprised that he has a challenger. I've had a lot of people uh, do the happy dance when they find out he's being challenged. Okay. They're very happy. I, as I said, I have not had one. I've had two people in all the doors I've knocked who said, I'm sorry, but I'm a friend of his. I'll be voting for him. Now, I'm not saying well, I'm... that's fair, by the way. Right, and that yep. is fair. And they had a smile on their face, and I had a smile on my face. But I have not had a huge overwhelming response of anybody telling me, no, I, who do you think you are right. running against him? I've had a lot of very happy people. Now, there's there's a significant number of incumbent Republicans being primaried this election cycle, more so than I, I tried to find an example another time mm -hmm. in history where, and, and it may be the case in the Democrat side, I don't know, but on the Republican side, I couldn't find a time in Michigan history, where the number of incumbent House and Senate both combined that are being primaried, have been, I've never seen the number that high before. And I, I frankly, I put that at the doorstep of Governor O. Snyder. I think his leadership, um, in terms of at least the, re the, re the Republican grassroots that put those people in office, mm -hmm. I think he's made some very, very binding decisions that, that and strong-armed some mm -hmm. of them. Um, not to put you on a spot with taking on Governor o. Snyder, but that that uh, that's the door has got to be on in my mind. Right, and when I first announced, and I announced back in September, there wasn't a lot of other challengers to incumbents yet. Now, now there has been. Um, Should have seen it in 2004 when I did it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I, I stood at Mackinac Island for the Republican Leadership Conference on a five gallon bucket and gave a little stump speech. Very nice. Yes, um, it was really fun, but um, I had several people say, are you sure you know what you're doing challenging an incumbent? Because a lot of the other ones had not come forward yet. I, I think that, you know, the, it's kind of cliche or populist politics to talk about only rich people um, are in politics. And, and some of the reasons, by the way, I blame it on myself, the electorate in total. It takes so much money um, if I were a political consultant, I'd tell you it takes huge money, mm -hmm. like 60 times for a person to hear your name before they'll remember right. your name, before they even think about getting to the issues you might represent. So it takes a huge amount. And the reason I'm on this path for just a brief minute is that uh, he's very well funded. Yes, he is. And um, which is an interesting fact that when I mention this fact at people's doors, they are just shocked. But several days, two days, I think, after um, Governor Snyder signed Medicaid expansion into law, uh, almost, it was $32,000 that was deposited in my opponent's PAC account. Now, I know that money that goes into a PAC account is not illegal, but it came from the company that's going to be managing Medicaid expansion in the state of Michigan, and it was all of... What are, what are you trying to say, Cindy? <laughs> I will say that's walking pretty close to the line, in my opinion. I, I've, I've recently talked about and, and here on the show and on Facebook and at some, some gatherings where I, where I spoke that reading finance uh, yes. statements at the end of the election cycle this year is going to be really, really yes, sadly be. educational. Yes. There has been these crazy votes where you look at the House caucus or the Senate caucus of Republicans and you say one third plus or minus, depending on which vote were, there's a whole bunch of crazy votes. One third of the Republicans peeled off and went with the Democrats, creating a new and very twisted majority, leaving two thirds of the, of the House caucus Republicans and Senate standing there going, what the heck just happened? Yeah. Because you're actually, it sounds fascinating, it's not normal, yeah. but you're actually challenging an incumbent and you're citing with the majority of the House caucus. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know that some of the folks you're talking to realize that. No, I don't think so either. And as I say, when I mentioned this 
at when I'm knocking on people's doors, they are shocked by the contributions he's received from the company that's going to be managing Medicaid expansion. Now, again, I say it's not illegal. It goes into his PAC, not his campaign fund. But again, um, to me, that's just walking a little bit too close to the line. There's another issue that I'm campaigning on, and that's a reform of no-fault insurance in the state of Michigan. And he also is very heavily supported by the anti-reform group um, to having a lot of fundraisers for him on the other side of the state. And that's the other issue that I think is a huge uh, issue that needs to be taken care of in the state of Michigan, our car insurance. And that's another issue people have no idea about, um, why we pay such high rates. Um, because it's, it's crazy. Yes. It's really a really... A broken system. It is a broken system. Um, I spent about nine months in Wisconsin, and the folks over there were literally laughing at our system. Mm -hmm. um, tell me this. One of the things we mentioned earlier earlier was the, the uh, Detroit pension bailout. And I don't know if, if the listeners and viewers that have heard about it realize it wasn't a Detroit bailout, but it was a Detroit pension bailout that recently, and, and your, your opponent voted for that. Mm -hmm. Um, my state rep representative in the 89th district voted for that. Uh, a, a fair, well, about a third, a lot, of, yeah. about a third of the House mm -hmm. Republican Caucus mm -hmm. voted for it. The problem that I had with it is this, um, for, you know, then because I'm, I'm kind of setting you up because I want to get a question answered from you. But when I look at the the circumstance in Detroit, um, I, I think that the folks that had this coming. The, the police, the police officers, firefighters, public works that had negotiated and that pension was a part of their wage, I think they're owed it. Okay, I do, but I don't think that the entire state of Michigan, who most of the workers don't have a pension plan of their own, I don't think that the state of Michigan in total should be paying it. If Detroit needs to sell off Grand Central Station land, if they need to sell off artwork, if they need to sell off every building they've got sitting down there. I know this, when I make a financial mistake at my business or at my home, if I'm running short, I got to sell something. I got to do something different. I can't say, hey, neighbors, I've screwed up. Come here. You, you, you can't <laughs> do that. So I, I set it up that way to let you know that I do think those folks deserve their money. I don't. I wouldn't have negotiated for it, by the way, if I'd have been part of the city management structure when all of those crazy pensions were being negotiated, I wouldn't have been in favor of it. But it doesn't matter. We've, they, the city of Detroit contracted with them. They owe the money. Right. So how would you have voted? Uh, I would not have voted for it okay. uh, by and, any means. But do you, do you think that the state had some, is there a remedy that you see possible from the state? Well, I would like to see the city of Detroit remedy their problem. Um, they have assets, um, the artwork being one, um, and there was other things I believe that they that they could have done. But um, I don't believe that the taxpayers of the state of Michigan should be responsible for bailing out the city of Detroit. I have in my district Benton Harbor, who did not get bailed out by any means. They had an emergency financial manager. Now they are slowly digging their way up, but um, so what? Uh, what? takes precedence one city over another. It's, it's, it, I think the idea of it is the size of it. I agree. One of those things, Detroit, but, but the problem that I had with it, tell me if I'm wrong, the, the problem that I had with it is that um, the, uh, uh, how shall I say, they've not cured the problems that right. caused the disaster in the first place. Right. Um, folks, we're going to go to a break. We'll be right back. If you ever find yourself arrested in jail and got bail, make sure you call me, Tommy D, at Bad Boys Bail Bonds, 866-728-6400. Because if I can't get you out, you ain't getting out. 
My name is Oscar Osbo, Oscar Osbo Audio and Video. I've been doing it for over 14 years here in the White Lake area. I've been doing the video for over 20 and radio for over 30. I'd like to tell you a little bit about what I do and I can do for you. I can make commercials for much cheaper than the other guys. Video editing, life stories, music videos, and sporting events. I also have been a DJ for over 30 years, so I have a DJ service that I like to bring to your next special event. So give me a call at 231-288-3580 or 231-894-0091. That's 894-0091. Also, one of my specialties is to transfer your VHS tapes, your cassette tapes, your 8-track tape, your DV tape, your VHC tape, your 8mm, your Super 8mm. How about your Hi8? Or maybe even your records. I can digitally transfer those, usually to be better than the originals. And to do that, I only charge $10 a DVD and $5 a CD to do the transfer. And then copies are even cheaper. So give me a call now if you have any of those things that you want done just for you. Oscar Osbo Audio and Video at 894-0091 or 288-3580. Call me today. I made a discovery. The down-home community our grandparents loved is still here. Seriously, that's what you'll find at Renegade River in downtown Spring Lake. You might be looking for a new or used hunting rifle or something for personal defense. Maybe a DNR sport license or fishing supplies. Personal and home defense. Hunting, Army, Navy supplies, fishing, survival gear, and even a tools and guy stuff consignment department. You'll be greeted by low prices and quick professional service provided by shopkeeper Mike Hewitt. If you're not in a hurry, grab a cup of coffee and join in the conversation. Renegade River, firearms, hunting, personal protection and survival gear, going camping or looking for emergency products. Come take advantage of the prices while meeting up with old friends and making new ones. Renegade River, next to the police station in downtown Spring Lake. Or go to the website RenegadeRiver.com. Are you one of the many Americans who undergo CPAP or BiPAP therapy? Replacing your supplies every three to six months is critical as bacteria will build up and worn out straps cause leaks. Call Allied Medical Supply Network and speak to an expert agent who will set up a schedule for your supplies to be delivered right to your door at little or no cost to you. Call Allied Medical Supply Network today and rest easy. Call 800-284-2512. That's 800-284-2512. Welcome back to the Mike Hewitt Show. Let me, let me, let's finish up the Detroit dialogue for just a minute, and then we'll segue into some handfuls of other topics, maybe a few at your choosing. Okay. <laughs> Detroit, we can't just walk away and say, fix yourself. Is that right? Or should That's we, right. Or should we? Well, uh, no, we shouldn't. There was an emergency financial manager appointed there, so they have some responsibility in reporting to the governor on what they're managing and how it's coming out. But the uh, taxpayers of the state of Michigan should not be on the hook, so to speak, for the failure of what has happened in Detroit over all of these years. Nobody wants to see a city fail. No. But on the other hand, I kind of follow the Dave Ramsey plan of financial management, and I think if you applied it to the city of Detroit, you know, you are responsible for your debts. I'm trying to imagine, with my most wildest, widest imagination, having the city of Detroit put itself on the Dave Ramsey plan. I think it would be good. (laughs) <laughs> I, I think so, but I'm between between talking about walking with the the, the Prince Jesus. I, I that's just, none of that's happening in Detroit. I'm sorry. Well, Dave's favorite saying is the borrower is slave to the lender, yeah. and that does not stop with bailing Detroit out. No, I got to tell you though, if it were a one-time fix, if we could go in and make her poof, here's this magic pill. pill I go as jeepers. Okay. I wouldn't. I don't know if I could support it, but I would at least sit down and rationalize why somebody would. I really would. I don't. I gotta tell you, I wouldn't vote for it. But I could still sit back and look at uh, the the fellow you're challenging, my representative uh, in my district, and I go, okay, I don't agree, but I understand. I don't understand this vote because they've not fixed the core problem. Right, and I don't know that they realize that. 
that's yeah. I don't know that they care. Well, they look at static <laughs> numbers. Honest, right. they, they they go into I the know big, they do. They get the big boardroom. They got the bean counters that come in, three or four city lawyers and, and some state lawyers, and they and they explain it away. And I think by the time some of these some of these uh, legislators get done, their eyes are glazed over. Right. And meanwhile, you, you've got the governor's office and the leaders that we talked about earlier grinding on them. To well, make, and I have read some of the analysis, fiscal analysis of some of the bills, like Medicaid expansion. And if you just went by that uh, and they didn't investigate anything else, right? that only showed one side of the issue. And so if they went by that financial analysis, that's why they voted it's for it. It's kind of like Common Core. If, if we don't teach children to know how the good parts of America got to be good and how those things that are wrong got to where they're wrong, if we don't learn by where we've been, we're not going to know where we're going. We're not going to be able to get there. And they, not, they, it seems to me that they refuse to pause and say, how did, how did Detroit get to where it's at? Right. And it's the principles again. Yes. If you have the principles of fiscal responsibility, limited government, then how could you cast a vote right. that didn't uphold those principles? But they're not principles, nor are they nor are they measures of integrity. Quite frankly, tell me before we run out of time today. We're down probably twelve or so minutes. What what are some things you'd like to talk about? Well, there's a big issue in the state of Michigan, and I've been told by several people don't bring this up because it's impossible to fix. Perfect. Let's bring but it up. But I don't believe it is, and that's called the CON program in okay. the state. Most not, people don't like know what COA. that is. No, okay. it's CON stands for the Certificate of Need Program. Okay. And in, uh, a comparison is that you've got two gas stations across the street from each other and they're, com they're having a gas war and they are competing and they are either providing more services or rate or lowering their, their prices competing with each other. That's a good thing. If you're a consumer. It is. Yep. And in Michigan, if you look at the healthcare industry, you cannot do that. Um, there are so many regulations and so much government interference in the free market application of medical equipment and health care in particular. I just read something from the Mackinac Center. Now, this is a couple years old even, so it's even worse that every man, woman, and child in Michigan pays an extra $740 extra for health care because of the CON program. And our legislature just voted to raise the fee this year. And my senator, John Prose, and I, my representative, Al Pashoka, who I talked to about this issue many times, told me to my face that they were against the program. And they both voted to raise it. So the fee raised from $1,000 to $3,000. And then it gets even more complicated because if you want to fast track a, a project or you want to do something else, you got to pay even more money. So it becomes this bureaucratic nightmare, even to the effect that a hospital cannot change the number of beds in a unit without having a group of people who are not voted on deciding that. Right. And it all has to be Medicaid reimbursable. So you have to know that you have enough Medicaid dollars in whatever city to cover whatever you're putting in. You look at the state of Indiana, who is booming in um, their, their economy, and particularly in health care. They have a hospital on one corner and another hospital on another corner, and they compete back and forth. And doctors in Indiana are allowed to purchase MRI units and CAT scan units and, and own them themselves. So you drive by a strip mall and there's an MRI facility. So then that has to compete with the hospital. So you have this constant free market exercise going on in the state where the hospitals are competing with each other. The consumers are getting better and better equipment and you have a, a containment on the cost because of the free market experience. Do you know one of the differences between us and them along with that is part-time legislature? Right. Okay. We've got a group, we've got a culture in Lansing that measures the success of a legislator by, by whether he or she is able to shepherd through the next nonsensical bill. And, and it's crazy for a state body of people, us citizens, 
to stand back and allow a culture to exist in our government that represents us, that is solely there to restrict liberty and, 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 uh, and breathe from the, the treasury. Right. I frequently tell people when I was going around with the part-time legislature petitions mm -hmm. that I gave them an example of a bill that was brought in front of the Senate, which was Talk Like a Pirate Day. Right. And they actually, you know, brought it up for a vote. And the senator got up with a patch on his eye and growled in the microphone. I watched it on YouTube. I could not believe it. And that's what we were paying for. It's in, insane. It is. It is insane. So I am a huge supporter of part-time legislature. Yeah, and it's not going to happen. There is so much power right. that that is vacuumed up. I think there are four full-time legislators, bona fide full-time legislators of all 50 states mm -hmm. in America. And when you say, okay, name me the, the top 46 economies, it's none right. of those four. Right. These things are not accidental. Right. When you say, w look at the highest gas tax, right. by the way, when one of the four, not one of the mm -hmm. four, not two of the four, all four of the right. four share four of the top mm -hmm. five positions for highest gas tax. It's an incredible culture. It really is. And it becomes an ingrained thing, very hard to undo. But I guess I've not given up hope that someday that yeah. will happen. I think it has to it will have to take a turnover. I've had legislators, well, speaking of that, by the way, I've seen a lot of candidates in my time campaign on part-time right. legislature. When they get there, they change their they mind. got a serious, serious case of amnesia, yeah. Yeah. okay? One of the things I like about doing this show with interviewing folks like you is that when you win later on, I'm gonna say, no, 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 yeah. Cindy, you said X, Y, Z. Oscar, bring me the tape. <laughs> See, that that's, that's the beauty of it knowing that you would, but some of them, they, they truly, they get into the power culture and that, that the little conference room with the beautiful wood walls and the, and the, the high dollar attorneys that are glomming on, yeah. on treasury tax money, they convince them. That well, I tell people when I'm out campaigning, I'm not a politician. Right? I, I have run for precinct delegate. Yeah, but then that's, you know, that's it. But I say I'm a nurse. I'm right. not a politician. I have no ambitions. Right past this. I'm not trying to climb the ladder in the political world. Don't want to be um, governor? No, I don't want to be governor. We need a different governor. My, grand, sure? my grandkids, however, think that grandma's going to be living in the White House. They haven't quite figured out what all this state rep business so means. president, it's a Cindy <laughs> thing. <laughs> yes, it's a Cindy thing to my grandkids anyway, <laughs> <laughs> who are my greatest campaigners too. <laughs> very, very cool. Good for you. So the, the the CON, am I saying it right? Yes, CON. That's one of your passions? It is because nobody talks about it, and it would change the state of Michigan. When you say change, I want to make sure that me and listeners understand. Are you talking about eliminating it, getting rid of it? What would Eventually. Do? It needs to be reformed. I don't know if it could yeah. be done all at once because it would probably be a shock to the system. But system needs shock. Yes, uh, yes. So maybe it could be done all at once. Right. But I have been told by several people don't ever bring this up because you've got the hospitals, huge lobbies. They don't want it reformed right. because they have a monopoly over it. Right. And um, so it would take a major, a major force to reform it. But it would just trigger a free market boom in the right. state. You'd have medical equipment. It's been dragging in the state for a long time. We know the economy in the state sure. of Michigan. Why not medical equipment? What are other issues? If you won, you got two or three legislative goals you got in mind, or what would you do? Well, let me ask you different. What committees would you like to be on? Well, I've several people have asked me that. Um, uh, probably education would be a great one because I think there's going to be a lot happening in the state regarding the Common Core and the uh, standardized testing. I am not a fan of standardized testing. Um, a quick story, my daughter, they have the standardized testing in Indiana and she's had children just complete meltdowns because they're taking test after test after test after test. Right. And it just is not good for students. It's not good for the education system. So, so that's one. Um, I, I guess I don't really know yet. Um, I, I know as a freshman, 
you're probably relegated to certain committees. Unless you got a lot of money. Uh, yeah, unless you got, I don't. I am running a grassroots campaign um, where my opponent has the big donors. I have a lot of individual donors. Yeah. And you mean you don't have 40 people that have maxed you out? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I've had anybody max me out. Cindy, I gotta say good for you. I really do. Yeah, good I'd much you. rather have the individual donors. Yeah. And I've got the people, the the these some of these elderly people are giving me five dollars, ten dollars, and I so appreciate that. A wise person told me if you look to the state the state legislators that are really doing the people's work, that they got really, really small campaign finance accounts and the ones that are working for the lobbyists have big gigantic accounts. Yeah. So I know which ones I'm gonna support and I always look at the campaign finance statements. Tell me we're down to sixty seconds. If a person wanted to re if, if a person wanted to reach out to your candidacy how do they get a hold of you? Well, um, I do not mind giving my phone number out. Do you have any problem with that? Your phone number. Area code 269-429-7769. My website address is uh, www.cindyduran.com. Very, very nice. Any final messages before Oscar turns the music on and cuts me off? No, I just really appreciate this, Mike. I thank you yeah. for inviting me here. I've listened to your program many times, so I'm just proud to be a part of Listen, the program. I, I appreciate you coming up here and folks don't know but your husband was here also. Thank you both for the long drive coming up and folks we'll see you next week. to you by Renegade River.